This conversation was recorded in the summer of 2017. Armando's latest film, The Personal History of David Copperfield, will be released on the 24th of January, 2020. So, Armando, when people like me can always remember their first ever television job, that's easily done. But lots of people can't remember their second ever television job, but I can. (laughs) Because my second ever television job, and I remember this with incredible, terrifying clarity, was being stuck in a helicopter that's going right. over the Palace of Versailles, throwing 40 kilos of button mushrooms. That's right. <laughs> and it was your doing. It was uh, It was on the Friday night armistice, or maybe it was yeah. the Saturday night armistice then. Friday night. But you were basically creating a mushroom cloud, I seem it was, to remember. was, of real mushrooms. It was a, a literal, an actual mushroom cloud. See, in those days, we thought it was funny to take a phrase that was fundamentally a metaphor... And and then do a kind of what about if we actually yeah. literally did it? And then Ed Miliband came along with his actual carved in stone slab yes. of promises, if you remember. I do. And that's when you know you just thought this has gone. Politics is now. It politics is now being written by people who think they are as good as sketch writers. And as funny as comedians, which and, is yeah, yeah, and sort of so politics is done in the shape of a joke, but. You know, to make it look like they're human, but it's not funny. No, because it's having a real impact yes. on yeah. real people. Because actual people literally die yeah. as a consequence of some of these decisions. <laughs> but it, those are sort of the halcyon days in, the, in, in that there was yeah. satire was possible because the people... I mean, it seems to me at that time with Friday Night Armistice, yes. Saturday Night Armistice, that, and with so much of your much, much earlier work, I take you right back to Radio Scotland where you were talking about the poll tax. You, there yeah. were, it was issue-based satire. There was issues, yes. And also uh, being plugged into the BBC, which at the time hadn't sold off all its different departments and costumes and whatever yeah. we were allowed in the Friday night Armistice, we were allowed to basically run around television centre and all yeah. its departments and muck about with other shows borrow I think I stole David uh, David Dunwoodby's notes from his live election special at one point did you? Uh, yes yeah 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 but it was all you know arranged because yes. we did uh, in fact we had Sally Phillips in a helicopter in the election special what was it about you in helicopters you I know. were trying to kill all she of your was female a, and- she was a whore in a helicopter <laughs> she was. who was going to land at the first when the first result came in she was going to land in that mp well, she called the whore create, in the sky the uh the the heli whore i think <laughs> and uh i mean it's all slightly unsavory now that i think it about is. it now, now it's that, heli sex worker yeah i know otherwise exactly, we're damned exactly. to hell heli person heli, heli. exactly <laughs> whose job happens to non-gender be non-gender specific non-binary with a job that in many other cultures could be deemed as one that she's forced upon to do in order to generate income for her family in a helicopter in a heli in a helicopter um (laughs) and yeah Uh, what was the point again yeah yeah yeah. real issues as you say real issues issues. real Real issues issues. did you yourself (laughs) ever get into a helicopter or did you just force other people to do it in the name of no but i remember the very first bit of television i uh made it was in the day-to-day and again it involved a helicopter because it was i don't know what it is about me with helicopters because it was for the day-to-day yeah and in the pilot of the day-to-day we did this sort of spoof of 999 the michael burke yes thing that involved a shepherd and his dog in a helicopter and the shepherd passing out so uh, <laughs> that's right the collie so takes- other shepherds were called into the control tower to whistle instructions to the dog to pilot the helicopter down but in the way that 999 does this what they didn't know was that a fire was in the back of the barge you know all these other crises. what we thought was that this helicopter was heading towards a field of children but this was in the days before CGI was cheap. So we actually literally had to book literal actual children and then fly a helicopter. Buzz them. Buzz towards <laughs> it. And I remember the producer of the show, dear Peter Fincham, who ran Talkback, and, and he was the producer on it, and he went on to do run BBC One and ITV and so on. But I remember him just watching us fly a helicopter at children and just I, I remember him just turning away looking like he was going to throw up because obviously it, it was like not what he'd signed up to do really i mean the more the more we talk it's about helicopters i don't, I don't know. know it's just a theme in your yeah. work and then i remember once being in a helicopter so you have been in one i have now been right. in a helicopter uh and it was great fun i love heights actually I do love you? heights. Oh, I don't love I heights. I couldn't like do the parachute thing because that's I, 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 I love heights but I hate having no surface beneath my feet. 
um, uh, and the pa- so I couldn't do the parachute. But I love being high up. Actually, I really get. I yeah. I just remember from that that mushroom throwing gig, two yes. things: the director, the magnificent Steve Benderlach, oh, who was wow, in the back yes. yeah, yeah, crying. Yeah. Who he was terrified of flying. Oh no! He was crying down my. <laughs> so I had these big cans on, you know, and I could just hear him going, "Oh God! Oh God! Oh, oh God!" throughout the entire thing. Yeah. And then I remember this huge bag of mushrooms in a rather unwieldy kind of bin liner. Yeah. And the French pilot really calmly saying, "If one of those mushrooms touch the uh, propeller, we all die." <laughs> <laughs> and I kept, kept thinking to myself, oh, but surely if one mushroom touches a propeller, you'll just have sliced mushrooms. But yeah, no, yeah, we, will all die. we will all That'd die. That would be a great funeral, though, remembering <laughs> Sue Perkins, who last week died when a mushroom got in the propeller of a helicopter. And everyone just trying not to laugh. We touched briefly on the idea of um, satire not being over, but being in a very different, we're in a very different world. Yeah, yeah. It's, yes. Do you feel slightly responsible but certainly your satire was so acute and so brilliant that you made the monstrous funny and almost acceptable i'm thinking of malcolm tucker yeah 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 well that's part of the reason why i stopped that and peter going on to be doctor who it was probably very difficult for him to play both roles (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, but it was when you know, bits of thick of it start getting quoted in the House of Commons, but also when you actually find out that people going into politics, these 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 sort of backroom uh, I, um, enforcers and spin doctors, actually modelling themselves on Malcolm and seeing Malcolm as a kind of a hero. That I I thought, no, something's not right here. I I this this shouldn't happen. This you know, mm. don't you see that this is meant to be indicating what's a bad wrong? Person. Yeah, this yeah. is wrong. This is what's wrong with politics. This is why people are put off by politics, that sort of spinmeister attitude. Um, but I, I reject your accusation it was- <laughs> that... Uh, it, was, it was a provocation. That uh, I'm responsible for... I mean, I, yeah, I think people genuinely are put off by politics, but I, I can... I, the thick of it was really an attempt to portray after a good deal of research, mm. what actually goes on. So yeah. all I was showing was what goes on. And it was Bismarck, was it not, who said that <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are two things you don't want to know what goes on inside sausages and politics. Oh, and, that's a and, great quote. Um, you know, and it's that. It's, it's, and it was inspired by Yes Minister, which, although it was a very traditional sitcom, you can see the scenery wobble, it's all shouted yeah. theatrically to a studio audience. Still very much was the very first time we in Britain got an insight into what really genuinely went on in in Whitehall, partly because the writers um, actually had uh, not leaks, but, but p- people from behind the scenes in politics coming to them with stories of what really went on. And, and think of it was a sort of, updated version of that approach mm. is taking stuff that does happen and then you play with it and you exaggerate it and occasionally you come up with stuff of your own that you think is even far more outlandish than anything you've ever heard and then a politician afterwards will come up to you and say how did you find that out we, we kept that quiet how, how who told you that you know and which, yeah. which is testimony to the fact that it's true and i i think there's nothing there's nothing wrong in revealing stuff that's true and and i if to the politicians who say you've put people off politics I, I say well well no i mean i i'm showing you what politics was like yeah it's up to you to demonstrate that it's no longer like that that's very true um, and and what i'm finding is that it's it's in many ways it's it's worse it's kind of ground down to uh nobody wants to debate anymore i mean everything is reduced to just very basic slogans like um you know, we need a strong mandate to strong talk and stable, about. strong, strong, and, strong and stable. Ca- coalition of chaos and all that sort of red, thing. white, and blue Brexit. Yeah, I mean that, that's a sort of psychobabble that, yeah. that your characters perfected and made brilliant <laughs> and funny in the national imagination, and now it's real and it's not funny it's because not it's funny anymore. And uh, I, I, and and actually, that's why I found politically, I kind of don't feel that I want to write another comedy about politics now i actually just want to write about politics now do you know what i mean i yeah, I, yeah. fine if you happen to be funny in the process fine but I, I i'm so annoyed by what's going on but also really concerned that 
especially younger voters aren't participating in politics. You know, they, 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 we're sort of disenfranchise, disenfranchising ourselves from that conversation. You know, the the number of people who vote has been going down drastically. So, since the, 1950, round about then, 90% of people would vote. And, and fundamentally, you know, 90% of those would vote for the two main parties. Mm. But now it's sort of 67% of people vote. And the two main parties, if we have main parties anymore, it's it's about 60% of that electorate who votes. So the particip and yet whoever wins gets total control. Yes. So So you're reaching a stage where fewer and fewer people are voting for a party that then has absolute power. And that's why people get frustrated and angry, but also disenchanted. Fear of the other in whatever form that yeah. takes. Yes. Whether it's people from over there coming over here. Yeah. Or, you know, dirty doctors who won't who can't be bothered to work seven days a week. <laughs> you know, whilst taking busy time out from their schedule going to food banks. Yeah. You know, it's but there there is that, that yeah. sense, isn't it? You're you're either with us, yeah. whatever us means. Yes. Or you're an enemy of the state. Yes. And I've never heard that rhetoric in this country before. No, it was something that's... I, I've heard it... Um, it it's been growing and growing in America, especially from the Republicans, in that the Republicans, when they were in opposition, I mean, it's different now that they're in control. Now it's like mm. government's very hard and uh, please bear with us. But when they yeah, were in opposition, yeah. it was like whenever anyone voted for a Democrat president, the Republican argument was, but that's unconstitutional. You know, to disagree with us is tantamount to just being wrong. Yeah. It's scientifically <laughs> wrong. And and when I was researching In the Loop, which is a film about the Britain and America joining forces to invade a, another country, and I went out and did this research, they talked about the neocons under George W. Bush, the, you know, the Rumsfelds of this mm. world, who genuinely did believe that if you disagreed with them, it was actually not worth our while continuing the argument, you know, because you had shown that you were an idiot and uh, by disagreeing yeah. with them. And therefore, what's the point? There's no point engaging in any kind of conversation with an idiot because it's just not going to go in. And yet this is from the man who came up with no knowns and known unknowns. No unknowns. No, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I, I mean, I want. I mean, you, as you say, you spent years, what four and a half years doing making. Yeah. Food. Did you, did you see in all that time when you were, you know, presumably in the same way that you did with the thick of it, getting intel from inside the White House and from yeah. from senior uh, level officials? Did you see the sea change coming? Did you know that Trump was inevitable by the time you left? No, I have to say I didn't see Trump coming. But what I did feel at the time was that the whole thing was gridlocked. The whole. The whole of uh, uh, American, the American Constitution is is predicated on the fact that no one branch of government has total power, and that therefore decisions can only be made by compromise. Yes, that's the whole point of it. That the that House of Representatives and and the Senate have to, in the end, agree on legislation between them. That in the end, the House, the Senate has a six sixty over forty threshold that will require members of the opposition to join in and therefore require the majority side to make some compromises. It only works if there's compromises. But what happened was about 10 or 15 years ago, they decided not to speak to each other. They set up these separate camps mm. and it was either, uh, and they defined themselves by the, the legislation they prevented from happening. You know, we stop this from happening. We'll say no to this. We're going to pull out of that, you know, and that's how they define. And, and I could see that because they weren't speaking to each other, nothing really was getting done. Yeah. And, and and that spelt trouble. And and it felt a bit like, you know, the end of the Roman Empire. This once glorious kind of peacekeeper, the Pax Romana, the, 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 the civilized world was at its absolute height of, and then just starting to crumble and cracks appearing in it. It got too big, too unwieldy, too many different groups that couldn't quite come together and, you know, and it started to fall apart. No, it took the Roman Empire about 200 years to fall apart, really. Um, How long's America got, do you think? Well, yeah, exactly. But everything is so accelerated now, you know, so I give it four months. <laughs> That's an extreme prognosis. <laughs> the leader of the free world is going to destroy his own country within four months. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> is it true, by the way, that when you were researching Veep, you 
you got it. I don't think it was the White House, but you you just breezed in somewhere saying that you were there for uh, a 12.30 appointment. Yeah, yeah, it was the State Department. And you just, I mean, it's, un, it's unthinkable now with the level of, of no, security and now. vigilance. This would be, um, well, it was, um, when was it? So it was about 2009. So, yes, it was post 9 11. Yeah. Um, somebody said, a journalist from a Washington paper said, Oh, just show them your BBC pass and say you're here for the 12 30. And my BBC pass is probably the same now at the BBC. It was just my face, it was just a photo with the words BBC, yeah, yeah. you know, that a child could have yeah. pressed the, F1. A hint on of lamination, you know, but not just, yeah. That's it. That and on a lanyard. Yeah, that's enough. A lanyard, <laughs> honestly, ISIS. <laughs> Uh, and, and also to be for balance, those against ISIS. Um, if you want to enter buildings, a lanyard is your secret weapon. It's true. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so I kind of went up and said, I'm, uh, I'm on YouTube, BBC, I'm here for the 12.30. And, and they waved me through. And I ended up sort of wandering around the State Department. And, and this was for what? So why did you want to get this in was there? For, because I wanted to see what it physically looked like okay. for our art department, because we were going to build the State Department for In The Loop. And for that reason, I thought, well, I might as well take photos. So I was sort of <laughs> <laughs> taking these photos thinking, well, Soon something is, is going to happen. Interesting, but it is also, I'm technically committing international espionage here. Yes. So, and then some big guy did turn up and go, excuse me. And I said, uh, I was with my assistant, Sean. Uh, I said, uh, we're, we're here for the 12.30. And he went, well, it's just over there. And and so we went into the 12.30, which was Condoleezza Rice's press briefing. It was her press. You were right up close with, with Condoleezza. Uh, her press, her press spokesman. It was, right. a, it was a daily briefing. Very dull. Very, very, very dull. Very dull. Um, but I then told this story when In The Loop came out and Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State then and she ordered a full review of security at the State Department. As a result, so <laughs> so so, when people think so of- as a result, she wasn't killed, and therefore stood as a Democrat candidate against Donald Trump and lost. And lost. So, so in effect, yes, I am responsible for Donald Trump. You are, there's a lot of responsibility <laughs> on your shoulders just in this brief in no, this brief time. No, no, I think about it. Yeah, but I, I, I just, yeah. <laughs> I love the fact that you still do that level of research and that you haven't passed it on to other people. Yeah, now. it's I can because I've just finished this film called The Death of Stalin and you know it was great we got we went round the Kremlin of course you did, went round did you Stalin breeze session. in there with a BBC lanyard going <laughs> up, I'm here for 12 30 <laughs> there was somebody said the Lubyanka prison which used to be the kind of the KGB's kind of where people mm. who were rounded up by Stalin were interrogated and, and shot and still is the headquarters of the security force so, uh, they wouldn't let you into it, but somebody said you can see it from there's there's a sort of um, review platform, a uh, viewing platform at the top of a big toy department, multi- multi-story toy <laughs> store in the sort of middle of sort of Moscow shopping centre. So it's like looking at Guantanamo from Hamley. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> so we went up to the top of and and I and actually what had happened was um, the the side of the viewing platform that looked into the, over the. Lubyanka had a big sort of um, plasterboard partition, so you couldn't actually see. However, there was a tiny sort of tiny triangular gap where the, you know, the wall and the plasterboard didn't quite meet. There was a there was a gap, so I went and looked through the gap. And then, and then as I sort of um, stretched back up, <laughs> there was from nowhere there was a guy in a suit and dark tie Ooh. and dark glasses who suddenly materialised in front. Who just went no. No. That's all you need. And I just went, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, understood. <laughs> and wandered away. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by HelloFresh. HelloFresh is the UK's leading recipe box service, delivering fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and step-by-step recipes to your door. It's the easy, convenient way to cook delicious dinners from scratch. Perfect for anyone who doesn't have time to prepare their own meals or just isn't very good at cooking. You get to choose your favourites from 19 recipes every week, including rapid recipes which will be ready in 20 minutes or less. They offer family favourites as well as British and world cuisine, including Thai-style sticky pork and penne ragu al forna. Well, this week I made the chilli non carne with zesty rice, a spicy vegetarian option that was perfect for a cold winter evening. It's flexible, so you can change the size of your delivery as well as when and where you want it delivered. 
To sign up for your first box, head to hellofresh.co.uk. Choose a box, a delivery slot, and add your favourite recipes. All their fresh ingredients come direct from suppliers, pre-portioned, so there's no food waste. There's also a great selection of veggie options. HelloFresh are offering our listeners £60 off four boxes. Visit www.hellofresh.co.uk and enter the code OUR at the checkout to enjoy delicious dinners without the drama. It interests me that that's so the film about Stalin is that you've, yeah. you've written about and created bogeymans, political bogey, bogeymen. Mm. And this is now about the death of one of one of the yes. biggest. This is sort of this is after the damaging man has done his worst. Yes. Uh, in history. Um, and so it's set in what, 53. So Stalin is now. 53, yes. Yeah. And it, it, it takes place. Stalin has a stroke and then dies and then there's the funeral. And it's really about the power struggle. It's really about what happens when people are live in terror all the time, are just afraid to say the wrong thing. Because if you, you know, for 20 years, if you said a joke about Stalin and somebody reported it, you could be shot. If you were with uh, having a cup of tea with a neighbour and you put your mug down accidentally on a photo of Stalin in the newspaper, that neighbour could report you. And you could be taken away. You know, it was that desperate. Um, so what happens when that person goes, when he disappears, you know, when he dies? And the power struggle that goes on between Khrushchev, played mm. by Steve Buscemi, and um, Beria, the sort of the head of the security, played by Simon Russell Beale. It's that, it's that kind of power struggle. But also, do you then start, and there's a, a whole element of it is about, do we just rewrite history? Do we say that the things that used to happen now didn't happen? And the things that we used to say were wrong are now fine and and baddies reinventing themselves as goodies and goodies trying to outdo the baddies by doing bad things. And, and there's a lot of I mean, we filmed this over. Uh, yeah, last last summer. So it was pre Trump. But there's a lot of dialogue in it about new narratives and alternative facts and stuff like that. So it's weird when we started showing it to people that were talking about how it was strangely prescient top, yeah yeah. To, yeah it was weird but th that's the thing isn't it by 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 focusing on sometimes completely different areas yeah. you can you can provide such a a, a kind of well I, yeah. cool narrative on what's going on well there. i was sort of interested in the idea of the strong man you know the kind of the putin type and you know yeah. the erdogan in in turkey and i suppose now donald trump but at the time i didn't trump wasn't on the he wasn't registering on the radar really um, but this idea of, and there's an element of the Farageist kind of, you, uh, there's a lot going on in Europe that is strangely reminiscent of like 1930s Europe, you know, and it's frightening. It is frightening. It, and is it true that Stalin, who had a, he had a stroke, didn't he? And that yes. people were so scared, yes. he didn't even intervene in his... That's right. And this is in the film. It's, it's a lot of the film's based on true stories. Yeah. He told his guards he didn't want to be disturbed. So when they hear him fall over... They don't want to knock on the door because they don't want to be shot, and 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 it's not a doctor who's called; it's the committee, the the, the Politburo called, and they then spend ages arguing over which doctor to call because Stalin had a lot of the doctors rounded up because he was suspected them of trying to poison him. So there's that whole dilemma as to there was um, a heart, um, a respirator, there, but they never used it because it was American. So they thought, well, if people find out we used it in America, we might be shot. There's a lot of that going on. It's that thing of like, Stalin was killed in the way by his own. Yeah, hoist by his own. His own, yeah, yeah. 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 I was never like to say hoist by his own petard because it reminds me too much of Veep, the, the opening episode. Of, oh, right, okay. Which yeah. is a very, for those of you who haven't watched it, a not. very, very <laughs> funny set of jokes around the petard. idea of being, yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Because you're so prolific and you have had your fingers in so many of the most brilliant televisual pies of all time i'm interested in how what your what your days are like what, what how well, do you structure much. your work in fact i'm very much a sort of five days a week kind of 10 till six kind of person really and i, I mean I, you say probably i don't feel that i'm prolific i sort of do one project at a time but while doing that kind of developing something so that there's something after that project I kind of have a vague idea of what mm. the next one is, but I don't... It's still fundamentally, I think, th two or three years between 
a project and the next one you know it's which is how long it takes to develop and pilot and get something up and running but all the, you you work very collaboratively so i mean yeah, so yeah, yeah. you have and your you have your hut so you're in your hut or yes, do you have others in your actually, hut actually no i i have got my hut but i tend to come into to london and and on most days and you know be working with other people and actually collaborating i find is much easier than sitting on your own yeah. and writing you know it's like it's human contact but it's also your your you push if you're working with someone else or a group of people you're all pushing each other into areas that you wouldn't otherwise have gone to yeah or if you did get there it would have taken you slightly longer to get there on your own so i find it a very efficient way of working and it also allows you because there are other voices, allows you to be surprised. That's the thing. You mm. can't, you can't, when you're writing your own, you don't actually surprise yourself. You know, you write your voice. But what's nice collaborating is that you're not, you're writing the voice of the show. But it does mean that other people will will genuinely surprise you with, with stuff that you wouldn't have thought of yourself. I was think that you, you worked instinctively in a very, in a way that was very unusual at the time, in mm. that, you were almost the showrunner and yeah. then you would have writers who would i'm thinking of ian martin who provided a lot of the uh, it is swearing ian, yeah, the swear consultant. the swear consultant uh he of the Which, famous marzipan dildo line yes but Which that has is, no swear words in it what no yeah, but so, it's just magnificent somehow, somehow he that is that's his first line actually that he wrote for us because it's at the very start of the first episode yes we are. of the thick of it and all it said in the script was he's useless he's absolutely useless and i said to ian um, I just he he wrote this funny website called Martian dot FM, and it was really funny. And I just got in touch with them, said, "Do you want to you know get involved, have a look at our scripts, and just add whatever?" And his um, inserts were done in red, so they were very easy to look at on the script. <laughs> they were furious, furious, absolutely <laughs> bilious. But it was great. So that his scripts would arrive and get printed off, and we'd just all gather around his scripts and look for the red bits. And and they were really funny. And that was the very first one. He's useless became he's as useless as mm -hmm. a marzipan dildo. And, oh. and that's that's when I thought you've got the job. You start Monday, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> so that yeah. but it was an organ that that sort of happened organically. It wasn't yeah. your intention to to no. To work in that and way. and that's why I kind of like going into d doing a show, doing a TV project or a radio or a film. So is actually. It's a sort of thing. I, in, I've got, I've got a very fixed idea of what it should feel like and look like, and roughly what the dynamic of it should be. But on the other hand, I like going into it not knowing precisely what the final content is going to be mm. on a week by week basis or in a ninety minute, you know, if it's a film. I kind of like that element of, as I say, surprise, being putting something in there that feels absolutely right for that project, but is actually come and and i always say you know the, in the end it's all about no how do i do this because it's visual but it's all about the four sides of the screen it's like mm. what goes in that and i really don't care what it took to get to that as long as that's as good as it can be i don't care if we sweated forever over a scene and then it got cut because somebody in a rehearsal improvised something that was far funnier you know I, and so it's all about getting people on board who aren't proprietorial about you know writing stuff and then seeing it get changed or altered yeah. or someone else adding to it and so and 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 also if it's really good then everyone gets credit everyone gets the credit and benefit from saying they worked on it so you know it's it's a win-win as long as you ha go in with that attitude that you're not hung up on so what you mustn't do this is more when you're directing you mustn't think oh but on the on the script it said that yes when you're there on set and you're thinking well that that's on the script isn't going to work because the location is slightly different um you know something slightly different tonally has come up as we've rehearsed it you mustn't get hung up on you know and what's good about this, working on the script is it's the launch pad for then what happens in the rehearsal which it, it then is the launch pad for what happens on the shoot which is then the launch pad for what happens in the edit you know. So, I mean, you, you have this incredibly collaborative way of writing, but then, as you've alluded to, you then have all these actors on the set and you let them inhabit the characters. You let them yeah. play around the margins to improvise. Um, in something like the thick of it, how, how what percentage of, of, of it's, stuff was changed? It's not a lot. You know, it's, um, 
it gets changed in the rehearsal process, but the writers are there and okay. the writers and myself are suggesting changes as we go along. And and in the rehearsal process, new stuff develops, but it can get very long and unwieldy. So what we do is take the kind of the essence of what we found was a kind of new sort of discovery about that scene and, and then rewrite it. So when you go on set, fundamentally you're shooting the script. If there's time or if it feels like the funny thing about this scene is the freneticism. It doesn't really matter what people are saying. It's just the frantic nature of it. I'll get people to say, okay, do it again, but just don't feel you have to hit all the cues spot on. Sometimes mm. you can do stuff like that and the first couple of takes sound really rehearsed, yes. spotlessly choreographed, so every line is clear and, and somehow the energy has gone. And, and to get the energy back, you have to tell them to just bash through it, talk over each other. Especially when you've got that cinema verite kind of documentary, yeah. this fly on the wall yeah. style. Um, it, it feels very strange when people are observing space between lines. Yeah, and yes. And, and what usually happens is it, they do the script again, but just in an ever so slightly different order. Really? You know, the lines just come out slightly different because somebody suddenly said a line that should be at the very end, but it just feels more natural to say it now. So I'm going to say it now. And then another actor goes, all oh, right, he said that now, so I'll say this now. And then another actor, she, she thinks, okay, right, well, they've gone to that bit, so I'll do this now. And it then suddenly seems, even though it's all scripted, it just suddenly seems like the performances are very, you know, they're brilliant performers, obviously, but it just feels like this is a spontaneous conversation that's happening. Because yeah. people are genuinely thinking of what to say next. But that, that's the genius of it. The mm. fact that you could have something that's so intensely crafted that what started out on, uh, started its life on BBC Four, so I'm assuming mm. very little money. But oh, that, nothing. It, nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and in fact, um, Rolly Keating, the controller, then controller of BBC Four, said, look, we've got this amount of money. What can you do with it? And I kind of worked out we could do three half hours if we found a disused set of offices. <laughs> some people in suits and two cameras wandering around uh, and one lighting state for the whole thing and we had like eight days which is what we did we shot sort of three episodes in, in, eight, in days. eight days yes yes <laughs> i mean I it mean, was frantic but normally you do what, one in six no one i know episode in six or seven i know, I know. Yeah. And our page count was like on a daily basis. We got through like we got through like fifteen or sixteen sides a day, and it's so funny because in big movies, in your big Marvel, you know, if you got through half a side in a day, you're laughing. It's extraordinary. Um. Would you ever? I'm sure you get asked, but would yeah. you would you ever make movies that you don't have that intense emotional involvement with or scripting kind of? No, no, no. But I mean, I'm I quite like to do a big film, not a huge Captain like, America. No. <laughs> Iron Man. Do you know, I used to spend all my money when I was a kid. I I used to spend my money on Marvel comics. Oh, so, I love you know, Marvel. So comics. I just collected them all, and then my mum threw them out when I was at university, not realizing they were probably worth a fortune. Gold now. mine. I, I think I had somebody sent me. Twitter's an interesting because somebody sent me a photo of a. I completely forgot a letter that I wrote that got published in one of the Hulk <laughs> kind of <laughs> magazines. You know, uh, or uh, anyway, when I was about eight, I <laughs> sent a letter in and it got published. Um, so I loved all that, but I and I loved when Marvel films actually worked. The first Iron Man and mm. second Captain America was really good, but now I'm just so, so overwhelmed. There's one every two months. I'm kind of I yes. don't know what to do anymore. The, the, the um, Fantastic Fabulous Four or whatever they are the, never the, the, quite the, took I, off cinematically, did it? It's no, so rebooted so many times. The, but no, no. I, I don't. But I think you're at the. Yeah. I'm a big fan of Captain America, and yeah, yeah the, I mean Iron Man almost now is it, it's sort of ironically eating itself isn't it there's yeah. so much there's so much knowing kind of exchanges between him and you the viewer that yeah, it's sort yeah, of yeah. losing its way a bit but I still love it but yeah. I'd love it if you did one of those I just it would be so the <laughs> but unexpected I know, thing yes I know but I know that what happens is that the director is there for the first two thirds of it and then is quietly removed well Marvel does Edit. what it has to do to make it fit its universe, you know. And also maybe so, you'd go mad if, you know, you. Yeah. I, I suspect some of these action scripts are maybe only sort of 20 pages long and they're just, you know, when you do see, you know, uh, a bit of dialogue, it's very sort of hastily put no, together. No, but I'd love to do a big... I mean, I love the idea of a spy movie or a Hitchcockian sort of suspense, you know, but something mm. that's manageable and in your kind of voice. So it's not lots of people shouting and swearing. Yeah, I do love you know watching things like Bourne and some really good chases. I, I think oh. when they're done well, 
Close really interesting combat. ones. You yes. Know? Or in that first, uh, the, like, the French Connection, the car chase in the French Connection, where they couldn't CGI and they just had basically to drive <laughs> cars at each other yeah. and over people. You know, <laughs> and, and I just love all that because when you feel it's real, that's when. And there's an element of comedy. You know, there's, there's a rhythm to these things. There's a kind of musicality or a choreogra- choreography yes. to them that actually I think writing comedy and writing farce actually lends itself to as well. You know, the awareness of structure and, and that sort of thing. Mm. You know, the reveal, the surprise ending and the selling the dummy and so on. That's all, com- they're all comic procedures but they're also what goes on in really well crafted suspense and horror movies and, and do you like horror movies are you i quite like horror i quite like you're a bit to... squeamish i imagine no you're... i'm no? i'm not really I'm no squeamish. what i don't like is like really graphic violence you know i remember i found the um it's going back a bit but the reservoir dogs the torture scene the reservoir dogs i found just i i I found it all unpleasant, really, <laughs> which yes. I suppose was the idea, but I didn't. So you won't I, settle down to a box set of Saw or, you know, no, Wolf Creek? No, not, not that interested, no. No. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Skillshare, the online learning community for the creator in all of us. Getting out of the rut is easier said than done, especially when you have a busy schedule. Whether you want to learn a new skill, or get back into an old passion. Skillshare can help build, fuel and expand your creative fire. And listeners to this podcast can now get two months free when you sign up at skillshare.com forward slash hour. Skillshare have thousands of classes from photography to creative writing and many more. I've just found a beginner's Spanish class which promises to teach me the basics of Spanish in a matter of hours. All the classes are on demand, so you can learn at your own pace and at a time that suits you. Learning new creative skills is a great way to relax from the stress of work and family life. Whatever your creative interests may be, Skillshare will have a class for you. Join the millions of students already learning on Skillshare and get two months free when you sign up at skillshare.com forward slash hour. That's two whole months of unlimited access to thousands of classes for free. Get started today by heading to skillshare.com forward slash hour. Enjoy. I know, I know you're a big sort of thriller and suspense man, but I read, yeah. I don't know if it's true. Um, well, one now has to prefix everything. With, I don't know if it's true, I read it. Um, fake news. I, fake news. That you've read all 66 of Agatha Christie's. Because I, I, I have, I think, read pretty much all. I to, yeah, I can't remember any of them. No, they're all the same. They're all was, the same. Yeah, I was about 14. Rich Woman on a Train gets it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And I haven't picked them up since. I'm intrigued. I might go back and pick one up to think, is it, is it that well written or is it not that well? I don't know. Because I was saying, it's, it's an ask. When you get to the Tommy and Tuppence stuff, it's a real <laughs> ask. It's just, there's, there's nothing in you now yeah. as an adult that would make you want to return yeah, yeah, to yeah. those sort of No, no, I haven't, I haven't read all those. No, no, no. It's all the Poirots yeah. read, and some of the Marples, but I haven't read all the Tommy and Tuppence stuff. No, oh, I, don't, but I used to. I, yeah. I think I've pretty much. I've certainly read every. Yeah. Poirot, but I love those. The idea of the locked room. Yes. Because it immediately sets the writer a challenge and yes. the reader. How how yeah. did you get out? How did, that yeah. um, like, you know those 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 old classics like Moonstone and yeah yeah, you know, yeah. I know you're a big Dickens fan. Are you yeah. are you a Wilkie Collins fan or you do not do not? Uh, no, I've read some into... Wilkie Collins, but it's been a while. Uh, but I'm, the next film project is going to be David Copperfield. We're going to do a film of David Copperfield. Um, this but, must be a dream come true because you are really I love well Dickens, known yeah, as a Dickens he, yeah, fan. Yeah, but this is like using uh, as as much of the dialogue being Dickens' own dialogue in the book because it is great. He's a fantastic... In fact, Simon Blackwell, who I'm, I'm writing it with, uh, he's actually done like a 200-page script version of just the dialogue and it reads tremendously well. So he just filleted out the you actual just, yeah, dialogue. Yeah, you just dialogue. read it and you think, who is this guy? Why hasn't he done more movies? <laughs> Let's get him in. Let's get him on board. You know, uh, and, you know the trick, the, the hard part will be turning it into a 90-minute proper feature with the pace and everything that you yes. you know and and not getting and but keeping it funny a lot of david copperfield has done very the adaptations are done very um reverentially there's a lot of pathos in it's it it's a lot of pathos yeah. and, and the love story is a bit dull yes really, i agree actually. and a lot of the really funny stuff is from his earlier or when he's quite a young man making his way in the city and yeah. not quite and getting drunk for the first time and 
having friends who don't have any money and then marrying disastrously. I mean, his wife that mm. he marries, who Dickens conveniently just kills off. Yeah. It's the only way to get him out of it. But, um, you know, that's the really interesting stuff. But for some reason, adaptations are very reverential about it's the older David Copperfield and this love story that's a bit, you know, yes. it's a bit wimpy. And it's a bit, um, so... Th- uh, but that's that's the next thing I want to do cinematically. Are you are um, you ready for the wrath, the inevitable knee jerk wrath of the Dickens societies? <laughs> um, well, the, I think I can deal with those three hundred people. Yes. <laughs> they're quite they're quite full. I did a documentary about uh, Mrs. Mrs. Dickens. Oh right, yes, yes. and r- the rather oh, shabby way that she was oh, treated by Charles, dear, dear, dear. and that that even though it was all yeah. factually correct, yes. and taken from his own letters at the British Library, no, no they were having none no, of it. No. No, no. I once, I once, I did a documentary on uh, on David Copperfield for the BBC, and I went to the Dickens Museum, and it's not there now. They've re- redone it, mm. and it's not there. But there was a, there is a portrait or a photograph of Dickens for practically every year of his life, so you can watch him grow up, and the portraits of him when he's like one of the world's most famous men when he's like twenty, twenty one, mm. and he's done Sketch by Boz, and he's done. Or Curiosity Shop and uh, Oliver Twist and internationally renowned. He was like Chaplin in a way. Yeah, he was, he was the first international celebrity, wasn't he? Celebrity. Yeah. And he's still got these like long flowing locks, cherubic kind of quite sort of beautiful kind of boyish kind of angelic. Face. And then you watch him because he was like quite manic in his energy. You watch him when he hits about forty five, his face just collapses and he just ages in twelve months. He ages by about twenty years, and you can see why he just pegged out at the age of fifty six. And is this was, was this when he he uh, left his wife and went off with Ellen? And, and that and... did all the tours, but was trying to edit a newspaper on a daily yeah. basis as well, while um, bringing out weekly uh, editions of you know of Martin Chuzzlewit and, and uh, you know uh, Great Expectations and Hard Times. And it just he just took on too much. He did but work he, himself to death. He wor- he? Yes, but you can see it happening if you look at his oh, look at his that. photos. How he just suddenly. I mean, it's it's um. He was he was a performer though. I'm just thinking yeah. back on 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 why his why his writing can be lifted from the page and put on the screen. Is he would he would act it out, wouldn't yes. he? He yes. would he would uh, you know famously inhabit these extraordinary yes. characters and, and I, talk. I got a chance to look at his um, his performing copy of Oliver Twist, and he's written in you know you know shout and he's written no directions to himself yeah. you know pathos here uh, <laughs> you know and slow down you know so he's got his little um actor's notes because he'd do the christmas carol wouldn't he he do he'd he'd famously tour and he'd do yeah. his scrooge and he'd do his you know these and what huge performances killed him in the end was going back to america and, and doing another big tour when he really wasn't well enough but putting all his energy into very emotional scenes like the death of um who is it in oliver twist who's uh oh, bill, well, sykes um, and, yeah, bill sykes yes bill sykes Nancy. 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 Nancy, Nancy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is a real, you know, he put all his energy into it. Imagine mm. Brian Blessed. <laughs> I do, but all he, the time. But in the body of a frail kind <laughs> of, you know. Yeah, so yeah. The, the, yeah. The, yeah. they hadn't got the pipes for it anymore, had he, basically? <laughs> Imagine Brian Blessed forged with Mackenzie Crook. <laughs> He just explodes. Uh, exactly. He'd just, just be atomized. Just, yeah, he'd just, just shatter. One bellow, you're right. He'd yeah. shatter like glass. <laughs> but I think it was guilt, though. He 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 basically worked himself to death because he felt, this is my thesis, yeah. he felt terribly guilty about what he'd done. And what so, about his marriage? I think so, yeah, about his marriage right. and his, his his life and his his because he behaved badly and just oh, regrets. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, also yeah. the trauma over that train crash and having to keep everything quiet. You know? Yeah, but, but also just the profound... Um, fear of being poor again of of the yes. shame of having no money going back to the blacking factory and worrying whether it was almost like he took on all these commitments because he thought you know I need the money I need and he clearly didn't need the money hmm. but he he felt in his head that he did because it might all disappear the classic self-employed nightmare yes. it's like I can't stop I can't get off the train yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll never get back on again yeah yeah, yeah. 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 I mean most people wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily think that that would be your next project but I think it's I think, do you know the, the one after that? Do you, have you, have you, do you, have you um, I mean, we know you're fitting in a Marvel. You'll be doing the, you know. Yeah, a, yeah, yeah, a, a, yeah obviously. A uh, Hulk or a. Yes. Uh, um, no, well, I've written uh, a comedy uh, about artificial intelligence as a movie. So I want to. See, you are just... prolific. You downplay your prolificness. <laughs> your prolificosity. Because no, I, 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 I wanted, after doing Veep, I wanted to 
direct more films. And I, I spoke to various directors who all said, you know, you've got to have three or four on the go at once because mm. the thing about films is they could all fall apart. You know, you're just about ready to start shooting and then, you know, you haven't got the money or the actor you really want isn't available now for another six months yeah. or or wherever. So you have to have two or three, not absolutely finished, but two or three projects that, so if one goes down, you can then pull out the next one and, and get on with it until the first one is ready again. And so what keeps you going? Yeah. The fact that you've done more in, already done more than most people will ever ever do in a <laughs> lifetime. Well, what, what, what drives the I engine? I don't know. What's I the... speak to like a really good teacher, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. speak to really good teachers all a the really time. A really good teacher will have changed the lives of many, many people but within over your, many years. Within your, yes, and doctors will have changed the lives. And, but within, <laughs> within the context of your profession, of what yeah. you do. yeah. Why? What? What keeps you? Go, what is the thing that gets you to the the man shed at ten a.m. <laughs> Monday to Friday it's without not really fail? A man shed. There's no there are no power <laughs> drills. Or, no. Uh, no. What gets me to the shed? Um, I don't know. I just um, an idea that intrigues me. If that pops up, or an area that mm. intrigues me, and and then coupled with, have I seen anything? Is there anything? that's like it already or because I don't want to make something that is treading ground that some 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 other show or film has done yes um uh, so it's that really but that's hard, so I do it? find I do in the end spend a lot of time either saying no to stuff or crossing out ideas and, and so on and is there any time for real life yes because if you work 10 till 6 Five days a yet. week. There's evenings and weekends, like most people. So have. what? Yeah, but what do you do? You know? <laughs> I only know. I only know of you in a sort of work. I mean, sometimes out of work, but you know, work-related context. Yeah. So what? Do no, we... I'm not a kind of showbiz. I'm not. A, no, I know I, that. No, 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 no. Of, no. You know, I don't go off to strip clubs with other comedians. <laughs> I just got my should, own. They're no, really good fun. <laughs> You should join us sometime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's every Tuesday afternoon, isn't yeah, it? That's yeah, the yeah, one. yeah, 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 yeah. Just outside Windsor, you know, yeah. isn't it? You'll find it. You'll find it. <laughs> um, no, I'm kind of. I see. I and I. I. We don't live in London. We live outside London, and you know, we have friends outside. You know, I've got friends, usually other writers or performers like Chris Addison or Simon Blackwell, Peter Capaldi. You know, those mm. David Schneider. Um, Friends who work in that, but uh, we also have like loads of friends who are outside that world. Your neighbours, or you know, who you know just through you know your, your kids were at school together. You know, parents from your kids. Oh, oh, and I just rather do that. And and I um, you know, I'm not. I don't have like a big big ho hobby that takes up all my time outside. So you don't the, garden. No, you don't. You don't. You don't rustle up sort of. You know, regional Spanish dishes. No. 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 I like reading and chatting. That's the very good <laughs> I've got hobbies. a telescope. I like a little bit of astronomy. But the thing about the thing about astronomy is it's, it's awfully late. You, it's, you've got to... They all start only come yes. out at night. It's annoying, isn't it? You know. <laughs> you to, yeah. I think maybe I should get into solar astronomy and just get one of those telescopes that does the sun and be done with it. Daytime so, astronomy is so limiting. <laughs> really, it's, really. It's just yeah. the sun, isn't it? You've got to be and, very careful. looking careful. at into other people's houses. I, yeah, I was going to say, the tilt of a telescope is <laughs> I'm, everything. No, I'm looking at the sun. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. I'm sorry, but it is just above your bedroom, just the where, it, where it is in the sky. You have to really watch that. Always yeah. maintain that. It's got to be up. Pointing yeah, yeah, up, yeah. otherwise. Yes. So, I mean, so winter is better for astronomy, except it's then cold. Jeez. But it's you impossible. can be, can't but you I love be space. inside. Oh, you need yeah. a skylight and you can be inside yeah. looking up. Uh, yeah. I've occasionally tried to have hobbies and then got a bit bored. <laughs> but I kind of, but I don't feel the need in the evenings. To, I, I haven't. I felt I've explored my interests during the day. So I don't come home thinking, I've got to do something to yeah. kind of show some interest. Got to you put know, a shed, I like a shelf up or something. Being home with family and friends. That's it. I just, I, I, we, we enjoy, I am a great fan of doing nothing, actually. Absolutely. Like holidays. I love, yeah, I'll go off and look at Roman ruins and all that. But I'm not into skiing. People go on about skiing and I just think, but it's your holiday. Why are it's you like going to the gym, but with snow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's cold. Don't go when it's <laughs> cold. 
and and also you can hurt yourself really badly and you know most of you i've spoken to have yeah. yes you know they, they say oh i pulled my hamstring I managed to get four days in though so it was great so no it wasn't <laughs> that sounds horrible what would you do what's your holiday what do i'm you do? cold and in pain stop it i'm paying for this so do you go somewhere hot for your holidays? I like, we like sort of beach holidays and, you know, interesting. We'll do kind of like a week in somewhere interesting and then mm. a week somewhere to, to flop. I've I've nearly been killed twice on holiday. Having said, I don't go to... Uh, there was the hippo. Yes. The other was on the bottom of the ocean when I was... Uh, there was a thing, it was a sort of scuba diving thing they did, but it was you were you were connected to the boat by a very kind of... Victorian looking Jules Verne kind of diving metal bell, yes, diving bell yeah. helmet that was pumping air into you and that you had a lead um <laughs> Wait, had, what's this is of 18th century no, no, <laughs> <laughs> no the idea was it wasn't very deep and and you went to the the, the the seabed which was you know it was about I don't know eight meters below but you walked along and then you there were lots of there was lots of coral but lots of fish tropical fish yeah and you held out little bits of cake and stuff and the fish would all <laughs> they love sponge they, they love, absolutely they love, love it uh, uh custard which underwater just is yeah. a mess <laughs> but they loved it um yeah. <laughs> um right so anyway and you've got these metal boots so you sink to the i had you've done a bit lead pants lead you've got metal lead boots. belts and metal boots right and so you're in the, uh, this diving bell yeah. pumping air so you connect it to the thing and a scuba diver comes down with you to make sure everything's fine and i had done a little bit of scuba diving before so which was fine so i wasn't you know phased by that however the air supply to the diving bell wasn't working <laughs> and so actually my my uh, helmet, my metal glass helmet, st just started filling with water. And and I was running out of oxygen. And what I didn't appreciate was when you run out of oxygen, you don't go, uh, excuse me, I'm running out of oxygen. Because the oxygen supply is not getting to your brain, you're actually going, oh, I think, I, I think I'm think i running out of oxygen, but oh, I don't care. <laughs> I don't know. We'll sort something out, I'm sure. Oh, I can't even be bothered now saying I'm running out of oxygen. I think I'll go to sleep. And so that's what happens. But fortunately, the, the other scuba diver saw what was going on, i.e. my helmet was full of water. <laughs> and I could just remember his like huge kind of like fearful look in his eyes as he, as he thought, oh, my God. Yeah. And he turned a valve and then the oxygen came in and the water poured out so i so that's so i nearly died <laughs> in a holidays glass, are not good for you jules verne type suit at the bottom of the sea because it's not like you can just come up for air because you're wearing lead no no i can get up no i know heavy shoes plus your hands are way down i had to, i did this channel four show the amani Nushi shows and for publicity they wanted me to be underwater but sitting in a barber's chair and having my hair cut. Of course. But all underwater. Mm. And and I thought that was fine because I get, you know, I, I've, I've done the scuba diving. So um, so we did that. And again, we we're in, um, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, the suit. The wetsuit The wetsuit. Wet yeah. And then my clothes, as it were. And then the metal. And then there's someone else there. So you're not connected to any oxygen. There's someone there who gives you the, the tank to take a deep breath in. And then you... And then yeah. you release. And then you kind of pose for like until basically you run out of breath. And then you make a signal and then they give you some more. And that was fine. Um, and we spent like all day at the bottom of this. And, and it was bizarre because it was at someone's house in sort of Ealing. It was, you went through their house into their back garden. To an enormous deep and pool. To an enormous deep pool. And it's there really to shoot, you know, like underwater cameras and, and things like that for photo shoots for, for that sort of specialist kind of camera equipment. But they did say that sometimes really harassed businessmen book in an hour just to kind of sit at the bottom <laughs> when no one can get them. Can you imagine what that must be like? Oh, Do you know, I'm man. so stressed. I'm going to drive to Ealing to someone's house. Someone's very deep swimming and pool. just sit at the bottom of a pool for like with two or three hours. With a metal belt really. on, yeah. yeah, and and with a with man no giving way. you oxygen when you give the thumbs yeah, yeah, up. Yeah. Or do they have their own oxygen? I think they had their own oxygen, so they could just sit at the bottom where no one, absolutely no one, can get hold of them. <laughs> that is almost the perfect metaphor for the modern age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. as bad as we've got yeah. now. I might need that address, though, in Ealing. If you could just write it on the back of an envelope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if yeah. your neighbour is building a, a deep, a small but deep pool, you know there's trouble. Mm. 
Thanks for listening. Uh, as always, you can post reviews at Apple Podcasts. Uh, you can post abuse to my Twitter feed at Sue Perkins. All are welcome. All the music in this episode was provided by Waiting for Smith. And if you want to check out more Waiting for Smith, then go to Spotify. When the marble has turned to clay And the people have all turned grey And the Romans don't walk so slow I'll be there if you want me to I'll be there if you want me to Oh, it's fair to say I'll be there every day